I'd just like to welcome everybody back for the final session of the first day of the 21st Century Arts Conference. And um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Richard Benge of Arts Access Aotearoa and Stuart Sexton. They're going to be talking about a research project that was commissioned by Creative New Zealand in 2011 called Arts for All. Following that, we'll have Catherine Chappell, the Artistic Director of Touch Compass, and Karen Fraser Payne, the General Manager. And they're going to be talking to us about the evolution of integrated dance and about some of the challenges of letting the art speak for itself. And followed by that, we'll have a performance from the amazing Touch Compass Dance Company. Um, Richard, over to you. Hello, Tato. Uh, it's great to be here, thank you very much. Um, with me is Stuart Sexton, who's our Accessibility Advisor. And Stuart is going to hold up a book called... Well, quick, get the book, Stuart. This is a resource book called Arts for All, which by the end of the talk you're going to be thoroughly knowing about. Arts for All was commissioned by Creative New Zealand in 2009. A wonderful book. There will be a, there will be a test at the end. No, there won't be. No, we won't skip it. But there will be chocolates. Now, the chocolate thing, me. The chocolate thing goes like this. Uh, every time you see a photograph with Stuart in it, because he's in all the photographs, you get to call out the venue that he's appearing in. Alright, and now if it's your venue, please don't do this. But if you see Stuart in a venue that you know, call out, and then at the end of our presentation, please come to our friend Maggie Gresson from Artist Alliance, who's down here, and she's got a chocolate bar for you, so that's cool. Um, I'd like to thank Helen Bartle and uh, her colleagues from Creative New Zealand for having the drive and the passion and the vision to help us design and deliver and run this survey. Um, what's really great about it is that it's embedded in the idea of you, the rest of us in the arts in New Zealand, growing our audiences. Um, originally we had the book, which was the resource, Arts for All. It turned into a national project of engagement where we work, to, we work with local government around New Zealand and we work with arts leaders, venue owners and operators, museum directors, entrepreneurs, tour managers. And we connect with you and get you in the same room as advocates from the disabled community. Blind people, people who can't hear, people who use wheelchairs and the like, so that everyone's listening to one another. So what that meant was, uh, what this program means is that we're getting more information shared between the venue owners and operators and the people who can buy tickets. Arts for All is a survey called How Accessible Are New Zealand's Arts Organisations and Venues? Survey development. In 2011, uh, Creative New Zealand wanted to know what would be the baseline of where we're up to with accessibility in New Zealand. So we thank you very much to the 41 organisations that completed our online survey. We all know what fun they are. And then we went and visited 16 uh, non-office based organisations and Stuart was the main person that did those visits. Here's your opportunity. Where's that? Yes, you're the winner of the chocolate bar, the first chocolate bar, so please see Maggie later on. That's very good. See how easy it is? Um, the whole point about this, and our conference today, uh, over the next two days, is looking at this, not only diversifying our audience, but building audience capital. So we really wanted to know how arts organisations can improve their accessibility and increase their loyal, returning, ticket-paying audiences. Where do, we, where, where do we get this information from? The last census told us that, what, the last census to ask this question told us that one in six New Zealanders identified as having some sort of disability or impairment. So this is an, an area in New Zealand which are potentially missing out on being part of our audience makeup. So this is a group, some of them can't hear our performers, can't uh, see your exhibition, uh, 
issues like they have to pay for the expensive seats because uh, wheelchairs can only go in the stalls. And maybe because they come from a disabled community, they feel marginalised or out of the picture and they don't relate to the arts at all. So our Arts for All workshops, our, our resources that we have online for you, help you connect with that group so that they can be part of your audience as well. Disabled people want what any of us want. They want to get into the buildings or the spaces, places where arts happen, and they want to hear about it and how do they find their way around the building. We're going to get Stuart to talk about attitudes and staff training. This is uh, what they asked. Our uh, uh, survey was divided into several sections where we asked you about the following, uh, about a number of uh, subjects, and we're going to uh, give you a discussion about these, these areas. So the first one was attitudes and staff training. Thanks, Richard. Well, attitudes and staff training is one of the areas that um, I'm very passionate about. Um, because I think that's part of the, uh, the overall experience starts right at the very beginning uh, with the staff. Um, so uh, there was an overall enthusiasm um, and awareness from those that we, that we visited um, about the need for, uh, to ensure that there, there was access to their events um, and exhibitions for disabled people. So that was really good to see. Um, you can see that um, of those organisations that were were uh, surveyed, and this was specifically um, around the, the online um, survey, uh, it showed that uh, organisations indicated they provided staff uh, disability awareness training. So as you can see, that there, uh, there's room for improvement there. That was um, 26%. So there's, there's a lot of room for improvement there. We recommend that staff... Um, awareness training to improve these, the, these things um, for your organisations um, and, and that can be by uh, training staff so that they get a knowledge of the different needs of, uh, of disabled people. Just because that there's you know, two people in wheelchairs um, in a particular area doesn't mean to say that they do things exactly the same way. Um, I you know, voucher to say that you know, everybody at each table here um, although we, you know, we may all be sitting down, um, we may do, you know, we'll, we'll do things differently. And that's the same with the disabled community. So often people with disabilities get lumped into, into one, um, one box, and that box is labelled, the disabled. <laughs> Ugh. Hate it. Um, <clears throat> and it's so that they understand the issues facing the disabled patron. Um, for example, getting through a crowd at an interval, that can be quite daunting. So how do you get around those sorts of things? We just did that now, didn't we? Trying we to did. From one path through the I'm system. sorry if I ran anybody's toes over. Yeah. It wasn't intentional, I'm sure. Uh, one of the other recommendations is that um, you designate a person or a small team uh, to be responsible for accessibility within your organisation. Ready for the next chocolate bar moment? Where's that? Theatre is that? Where? No, go further north. No. No. Try the mighty Wack Waikato. It's accessible. Who's hey. the founders? Sir, you win the chocolate bar. Congratulations. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Fantastic. <laughs> right, what we're going to talk about now is building access. Uh, colleagues, we found that all non-office-based organisations were physically accessible to disabled people. That is, that we were compliant to the minimum, minimum standards of the building code. Now, I have a colleague in the room who I also admire, who once said to us, in our new building, we are going to work beyond the code. And that's quite a challenge. And what does it mean when we want to work beyond the code of the minimum that we have to do? We found that 33% um, of arts organisation visited had signage that was clear. What does clear mean? And 50% had all signage that was consistent. So if you think about your own space, and when your signage got made and when it got replaced or whatever year it got built, how 
vague can your signage be for someone who really needs to have a clear idea of how to get around your building? How to find the toilet. Pretty really important. Um, yeah, that's right. 75% uh, of arts organisations visited had rows, how their numbers were, were identified in a clear way. But, and here for you for theatres, only 25% of those organisations displayed their seating numbers in a clear way. So that's tricky. But what's really great, and I want to congratulate us all on, is that most organisations that we visited have an accessible evacuation plan. Thank you. Keep that good job up. And 77% of you, 77.8% have trained staff that are ready for an evacuation. And you know you have to do that within the law. But you can imagine how important that is when it comes to disabled patrons. It's and kind of nice to know that I'm not going to be left. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and parking, all visited organisations had accessible parking at the door. Um, we recommend that the Arts for All resource book is used. We have this available through our website, which is going to be shown to you at the end of the talk today. Um, that has many uh, helpful downloadable checklists that you can go through to help you sort out signage, doorways, those sorts of things. We really want you to promote and advertise and communicate the accessible features of your venue because you'll know what those are and you'll know what the non-accessible ones are. But it's really good to promote just how accessible you are. And the first thing to do is use international symbols of access to demonstrate that the patron can expect physical and service accessibility in your building. One gentleman who showed us around some buildings who first of all thought we were the access police when we arrived, Stuart and I went to one group together, we saw a great set of buildings that had been renovated over a number of years and everything was code compliant. In fact, there were some really good parts to it. And our colleagues said to us, so we've kept our buildings compliant and we're ready and willing for people to come in, but we're not telling the disabled community about There's this. nobody coming. Well, not enough. Ready for the next chocolate bar moment? Where's this? Civic. Civic. Who's that? Okay, you get These are too easy, bar. Richard. Yeah. These Chocolate are too easy. Goes to Napier. That's great. <coughs> We're going to talk about communications now. And uh, I'll let you talk about communications, Stu. So, um, as Richard said, you know, letting people know uh, that you're accessible is really, really important. Um, and that's the same can be said about, about uh, your websites. Um, so we noticed that during the survey that uh, they all looked, you know, really good and some really impressive uh, uh, websites out there promoting your events and your and your uh, and uh, what what you were doing. Um, but it's important to think about what uh, your disabled patrons need to know about your venue and your or, or the shows that you're putting on. Uh, things like can I can, can I park near the venue? Uh, how how will I get to my seat? Whereabouts is it? Uh, can I sit with my friends and family? And how far away from my seat are the toilets, and are they accessible? So that's some of the you know just that that's just I mean that's just a, a handful of some of the things that um, that we have to think about. Traditionally, when a person with a disability goes out to an event or something like that, they tend to plan um, quite a, quite a way in advance. Um, so they'll look at the website and, and, they'll, and they'll look at some of these things um, and uh, that they may even come and visit you, come and see where your toilets are before they get to the, to the event on the night because um, that's you know, quite an important, important thing to them. Can they you know, take accessible transport, those sorts of things? We just had a, I attended a workshop just now with Guy about uh, fundraising and about talking to your uh, audience uh, talking to your prospective donors, um, one of the things that we advocate for um, outside, this isn't about fundraising, but it's about connecting with your communities. So if you have asked your community and engaged with your community about what they need, and they know that your venue 
is actually really interested in you, then they're going to come to things that they want, that they feel comfortable about in your venue. And we do talk amongst ourselves as well. <laughs> <laughs> so any good, good or bad uh, experiences yeah. do get shared. Let's talk about the services that um, are offered throughout arts organisations in New Zealand. What was really great to learn was that 100% of theatres and venues that we visited have augmentation systems, primarily he hearing loops. And almost 20% of organisations surveyed had provide audio described performances. So we can congratulate our colleagues at the edge, uh, downstage, circa, and a few other places for doing, and uh, the Fortune Theatre in Dunedin for doing audio described performances. This is a really great development. And it brings in a new audience, and the hearing audiences that attend, if they know that there's um, or augmentation going on through uh, uh, through an audio described performance. They find that very interesting as well. I recommend that you go along and if you if you ever, haven't ever tried one, see if you can get along to one. And so that's what, what we talk. Like. Yeah, we talk about uh, outreach to uh, diverse communities, and an example of outreach is to uh, the deaf community, to, uh, to the blind community. Sorry, to have an audio described performance. In the area of ticketing, ticketing is an issue for disabled people not only because the majority of disabled people, or many disabled people are on fixed or limited incomes, but um, where they sit in the theatre is often determined, as in Stuart's case, uh, if he's in a wheelchair he gets to sit in the stalls, and the stalls are more expensive than where his friends might be sitting in the gods. So this is an issue. Um, we also found, when we asked, which was really good, is that um, organisations would like to or would consider or already do provide ticketing uh, discounts to disabled patrons. But going forward, that when we're dealing with a disabled person who has a lifelong disability where they require the assistance of a companion, then that they would be okay about providing a discounted ticket under a companion scheme, which is its way, which is what it's referred to in Australia. So what we found was, and one of our colleagues in a meeting said, do you mean that if we provide a comp, we'd get a guaranteed ticket purchase? So when it comes to the economics of that, it's not such a bad thing. We're not being uh, giving away tickets just because someone is coming with a companion and they need the help. So one of the major um, <clears throat> barriers to uh, people with disabilities uh, is attend, to, get, to get them to attend is, is as Richard's pointed out, <clears throat> is the cost. Um, you know, people will think twice about about attending an event if um, they don't think you know it's going to be valued for money for them. Or can they see where are they going to sit? That sort of thing. Um, so as Richard's mentioned. Um, having the support of a companion to help them out, to help them get to where they need to get, um, is, is really important. Here's our next moment. Who is Stuart visiting and where is that? If you know the person, then it'll be easier. This is a real trick one, really. No? We're thinking down here. Catherine's thinking. Catherine knows it. It's to do with music. Call out if you think you... Opera, New Zealand Opera, thank you very much. You get the chocolate bar. Come and see Maggie at the end of the show. Thank you. Even the back rows listening it's to the, us. It's the props workshop. We're almost at the end of our Which talk. Which was accessible, by the way. Yes, it was. It was fantastic. That's why Stuart's there. We're going to talk to you about policy. Mainly because uh, we found that 78% of arts organisations had not developed any formal accessibility policy in their organisation. But... Almost 5% had, so that's great. That's to be thanked. What's important here is oh, there's the number of uh, organisations who had no formal accessibility policy. So for our organisation, Arts Access Aotearoa, we are here to help you develop a policy if you don't have one. 
It doesn't have to be a scary thing. It's really a set of principles that your organisation ideally uh, provided at your board level sits within your organisation so that you know the way you're going to proceed with uh, looking after uh, disabled people in your, that come into your organisation that you want to have as patrons long term. What are the principles that are going to guide you going forward? So we have a uh, checklists, we have uh, people ready to assist you on the phone and when we visit your city and we're in Dunedin, we're in Wellington, New Plymouth and Auckland and soon to be other parts of New Zealand, um, we'll be working on workshops that will help you develop those policies if you can attend those workshops. But if you can't, then you can go online and start to do that in the first place. And the really good thing about having a policy is that if the person that's in charge of access within your organisation or the group of people, if they leave, the whole thing's not going to fall over. Yeah. It's, it's there, it's embedded in the organisation. Here's the last picture. Q Theatre. Someone from Auckland. Yes, Catherine, you win it. You in the last chocolate bar. Whereabouts in Q Theatre? Oh, someone else said it was Q. Yep. It's on the lighting grid. Yeah, it's the okay, only so accessible lighting rig that I've been in throughout New Zealand. So Stuart could actually be a lighting technician by the, because of the great design of Q Theatre. Last part, programming. Obviously, matinee performance, well, not so obvious to some people, matinee performance times are popular with people with disabilities. Can anyone tell me why? I'm sorry there's no chocolate fish writing on this one. No? No? Sorry, what was that? Is it easier to see? Yeah, that's one of the reasons. It's easier to see, obviously, during, during, during the, the daytime. Day um, it's easier, you know, there's more transport, there's more, it's easier to get around. Yeah. What's also interesting when we were discussing programming and asking questions about that is 60% uh, of arts organisations visited have programmed work by disabled artists or mixed ability companies. And a lot of those have had Touch Compass perform in their venue, so that's um, great that we're going to be um, hearing from and seeing Touch Compass next. 20% of arts organisations that we visited have programmed work or are portraying uh, a work that has a person with a disability. Uh, programming initiatives to bring disabled people in your venue. Things that we've talked about today are audio described and signed performances, touch tours, program disabled artists on artistic merit, and as we've said, productions portraying a person with a disability. Often, you know, whenever I've been tripping around to visit people and you tell them that they need to become accessible, you can almost see the dollar signs light up in their eyes and they go, Ugh! Help! What do I do? But it doesn't necessarily need to be an expensive exercise. So here's some of the um, some low cost things that you can do. One of them is attend an Arts for All training workshop, and that's where we'll come and help you. Uh, complete an Arts for All checklist. Again, that's um, Richard's going to give you that that link a bit later on. Um, developing a, a policy, so that's something you can do within in house. Reduce uh, trip hazards and adequate uh, adequate light hazards. Um, around that trip hazard, um, I recently did some... I'm a disability awareness consultant. I work for myself um, and contract to the to Arts Access. Um, and I did some work with a, um, a training organisation recently who had a ramp, and it was, it was a good ramp. There was nothing wrong with it. Um, but you know when you paint... Um, a ramp, a wooden ramp, and you paint it, and the ramp gets slippery, especially in the good weather that we have down here in Wellington. <coughs> Don't mention the weather. Um, they they tend to get a bit slippery, and these guys were really worried that somebody was going to fall and hurt themselves, and they were worried that it was going to cost them big dollars to to take the ramp out and put it put it back with a with a concrete one. 
So I said to them, they were very trusting actually, I said to them, give me $20. And they said, what do you want $20 for? I said, I'm going to fix your ramp. And uh, I went down to the local hardware store and I bought some chicken mesh. And I came back and found a hammer and I nailed it to the, to the ramp for them. It cost them $20 and they fixed the problem. So it doesn't necessarily have to cost big dollars. That's the number eight wire story, Stu. It sure is. Chicken wire story. Just before we uh, close, um, I'd just like to remind you that Arts Access Aotearoa has resources to assist you. Uh, to assist your audio, your organisation get closer to the one in six New Zealanders who could be part of your audience mix. Some are now, but we can all do better. Um, Arts for All Opening Doors to Disabled People is a downloadable resource. Um, as I say, it was, was uh, created with Creative New Zealand in 2009 and it's ours to use. It's full of great ideas um, and ways to improve your accessibility. Um, the Arts for All uh, check, uh, resource has checklists that you can go through and share with your staff, hopefully the staff that you designate to move your accessibility forward. Um, we've got an information service and the phone is on uh, this slide but also we have a website, uh, but you can just Google us at Arts Access Aotearoa and find us that way. We're very grateful to you for listening to us. It's been a pleasure to travel around New Zealand and meet some of you. We're here to support all your initiatives and we really appreciate, first of all, that you have created safe places that can evacuate disabled people out of your venues should they be in there and that there's a genuine willingness from everyone to get accessibility right. The, so we don't need to get too fearful about getting it wrong. Um, we're just here to assist. And the main thing that we can encourage you to do is, if you, yes, talk to us, but also engage your local disability advocates and your community leaders, and they'll be the first ones to tell you how to improve it, and they'll be the first ones through the door of your organisation to buy tickets. Thank you, Kia ora. If any, Just on that, if anybody wants any uh, information on who, you know, where they can get in touch with their disability organisations, um, let us know, because um, I've got some contacts.